Here we are with the first panel of the day, of the, the second day, um, and this will be with uh, Christophe, uh, Baptiste, Adam, and Michael. So we're going to have uh, uh, both the, like the, the, the speaker in the talk and their collaborators. We have this mystery about an Easter egg that you posted online in your background while you were doing the talk. Okay, uh, I'm going to to show you rather. <laughs> so that's all right. Ah, uh, okay. that was the Easter egg. Pavel, you you got that. Can right? I ask? Yeah, can I ask because I thought there's actually two Easter eggs. Uh, maybe there's maybe that was by accident, and you know, great minds think alike, that kind of thing. But uh, I saw the darts on the table, so I thought that was the one uh, one Easter egg. The other thing was um, was that the books that you had on the bookshelf were really familiar, right? And 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 I think all of those books were well, most of those books, at least on the shelves on the sides, were listed on Rich Hickey's uh, bookshelf, right? Like he, Rick, Rich Hickey posted at some point his you know, whatever, reading that, reading that inspires closure. And I think all of those books on the side bookshelves were, was that intentional or by accident or just like the same books or what happened there? Uh, for foundation of databases, it, it definitely comes from uh, which cheeky bookshelf, but uh, the other is uh, an accident. That is uncanny. <laughs> Great minds think alike, I guess that's the that's the answer. So I'll leave it now to John to see if the other guests are available. Thank you, Renzo. Uh, so let's see if Adam is online. I can see he's got his Hi, camera. yes. Hey, there we go. How are you doing? Um, I'm quite all right, that, thanks. That was an excellent talk. That's an impressive microphone. Um, <laughs> I thought mine was good, but yours is even better. Um, <laughs> oh, it just looks, you know. <laughs> uh, so question to you is, uh, is there anything um, curious or interesting you'd like to share <clears throat> about your surroundings, about what's going on at the moment? In my surroundings? Well, uh, it's a bit of a peculiarity, but usually on my desk, I always have a deck of cards, you see. Nice. And, uh, it's a bit weird, I know, but the thing is, uh, when I was quite a, a bit younger, I used to do a lot of magic tricks, you know, and so I don't have much time for that these days, but I usually <laughs> always have a deck of cards so that when I have to do some readings or long session and all that, it keeps my hands kind of busy and it can help me concentrate. So a bit of a fun uh, mm. thing to, to say, I guess. <laughs> Excellent. I suppose tricks. it's yeah, it's good for uh, keeping the dexterity in your fingers and stopping RSI and things like that as well. So great stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, do we have Michael as well? Yes, indeed. Thank you. And uh, and yourself, have you got anything you'd like to share briefly? You've got a very nice seat you're sitting on by the looks of things. Yeah, this is this is Secret Lab Chair. So this is, I'm supporting, so I live in Singapore. I'm supporting a local company, Secret Labs, that makes gaming, excellent gaming chairs. So I can put in a sponsorship plug for them if anyone wants a gaming <laughs> chair, Secret Labs if they want to go to. Excellent. Thank you very much. Renzo, do you want to ask the first question? Yeah, let's go with the first question. Um, we want to know, uh, first of all, uh, if that bookshelf was Christophe or Baptiste's, but I think uh, we, we saw that live uh, and we know that now is Christophe bookshelf. Um, so another question is, what is the meaning of that dot ampersand in Closure Dart? The dot ampersand is, is mostly on its way out. But in uh, in closure dart, uh, well, in dart, you can have named parameters to a function. So the the trick we when we started designing closure dart was to find a way to tell closure that from this point on, these are name named parameters that you have to pass to this dart function or method. So the the dot percent was used as a delimiter to, to instruct the compiler that it was an interop form with uh, named parameters. But uh, 
we add to to resort to this to this solution because in at the start of the project we we made all variables dynamics and by making them all dynamics we we got to to produce code quickly but it was it wasn't efficient and we had other problems down the road now that we have proper type inference on uh, all methods we know when a method is going to have name parameters so we don't need them anymore we are just phasing them out at the moment so right, basically you, it's just a syntax oh, to, to use the name parameters right now okay thank you for the clarification um john do you want to take uh, a question for adam or michael the question i guess for adam is like what do you see is the the overall vision for cortex world what do you expect uh, that that will enable and grow into um and like is it comparable to things like ethereum and so on is that or is that like a very different kind of tangent on what you're trying to do oh sure you could very much compare it to ethereum uh, but because we have uh, this ability to build complex data models and it's also much, much faster, at least in our uh, bench, um, current benchmarks, um, you can go much, much uh, farther, right? Um, I think that this kind of tech has um, the same kind of effect on blockchain that Clojure had on Java or on the GVM, you could say, right? The GVM by itself as a uh, way of, of, you know, just having a virtual machine and, and um, it's very capable, right? Uh, but you want to have something that is more sophisticated and allows you to, to, to handle more complex data and um, you can go very, very far. Uh, I think that Mike has many examples he'd like to give you, I guess. Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, certainly, I, mean, I think the vision of the vision of Convex is definitely that it can be a building block for people who want to build the sort of next generation of decentralized applications. And I think some of the things that I, I find particularly important is I was horrified by the energy efficiency, inefficiency of things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. It's just, uh, it's just ecologically unsound. And uh, one of the motivations for me, certainly, in contributing to Convex was, was building something that was super energy efficient, super fast. And it has a sort of low latency, uh, which makes it usable for things like gaming or consumer mobile applications, web applications, these kind of things, which are currently impractical <laughs> with a lot of current blockchain technology. So, so my, my hope certainly is it becomes a valuable tool in the, in, in the, as a building block for people who want to build these decentralized applications in the future. And can you say a little bit more about the energy efficiency? Is that due to closure or is it just kind of like your design or the infrastructure? I think there's there's two things. One, the JVM is actually a pretty good execution engine, and we all know from Clojure that you know the JVM gives a very solid foundation on what to build, a very good performance, and obviously JIT compiler and, and stuff like that. Um, the garbage collection turns out to be really really useful for decentralized apps, where you've got these big immutable data structures with structural sharing, and sometimes you have to discard large chunks of it. The GC is very valuable. But I'd say the main reason that it's efficient is that convex uh, in, the, in the design of Convex, we found a way for the peers, the decentralized peers, to agree on an ordering of transactions without burning energy. Yeah, you don't have to spend a bunch of time or compute or storage in order to reach that consensus on the ordering. And that's kind of the key innovation. Yeah? It's how do you make the ordering of transactions stable, consistent in consensus without spending any electricity or other computing resources to, to, to work that out, or, or at least minimal. So it, in a local test network, you can, you, can, you, can, you can literally pump millions of transactions through Convex. <coughs> it's incredibly efficient. With okay. Virtually no and regarding right. resources, if I may add, uh, there are a couple other innovations I, I didn't talk about today because it was kind of more advanced. But for instance, there is a, a kind of a memory allowance, right? Because on, on networks like Ethereum, when you store data, you pay fees, fees just once and that's it. Then the, the, the peers have to store it forever, which is kind of unlogical if you think about it, right? Well, there are here what you have is, is the fact that uh, you have some amount of memory that you can use. And then if you, 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 you lack some, then you can automatically buy some, 
for convex coins. Uh, during a transaction, I mean, it's completely automatic, right? And um, if you release some memory because you, you uh, undef some data, for instance, then you could sell it back, for instance, right? So you, you have that kind of mechanisms that uh, have been embedded um, in the network so that you have some incentive to keep things clean. And uh, so th there is also this category of innovation that prevents uh, things like uh, wastage, essentially. Excellent. There's obviously a lot of thought has been gone into that aspect. I'm very happy to see that. Thank you very much. We have uh, another question for Christophe and Baptiste from Ben Sless, who is the next speaker, by the way. How much of these conclusions and techniques could be applied to Closure's compiler? Anything from inferring nils for tests to Project Valhalla, which should allow the JVM to get past type erasure? I'm not sure it would be possible to um, type in terms as it is uh, plugged in uh, the compiler. And uh, to be honest, I, I don't uh, understand the goal of a Project Valhalla. So maybe Christophe, do you have inputs on this project? No. So uh, basic type inference will be uh, stuck to closure that. <laughs> okay, Christophe, uh, do, are you are you with us? Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with Project Valhalla, but uh, for for the type inference itself, it's really tied to to closure to to that itself. It tries to mimic correct to mimic and uh, and simulate the own Dart uh, type system so as to be able to to please the compiler because otherwise the Dart compiler is pretty it's pretty harsh. There are so, even some uh, some cases which which uh, I consider borderline as bugs. For example, I remember with uh, Nilables, you you have uh, you have an operator dot question mark which allows to no it was it wasn't even with a proper uh, special operator. We had one line which was checking a value against null, and if it was null, it was throwing an exception. And then, because the code uh, the code generation wa wasn't quite good, further than the line, there was also there was the same test anew, and that compiler was complaining because once it passed the first if, which would throw if the value was null, he was complaining that we were testing a non-null value against null. So the type inference is really uh, there to be able to, to be as smart as the Dart compiler. Otherwise we get weird errors and so on. So yeah, it's, it's, it, it, seems really be, it, it seems to be pre premature to like think that there is anything we can like uh, introduce into the closure compiler. Um, in this kind of sense. That was the original question, that's why I'm asking. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that just maybe Neil and Sum could, could be helpful, but I believe there are already some, uh, some handling of, uh, of that in closure. Thank you, Christophe. Um, John, any other question for? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so there is a question from the Discord channel. Um, could you please explain the consensus procedure used in Convex in regards to power and pause? How does it differ? How does reaching consensus work? Well, that's a very complex uh, question because this is the, the hardest part of the whole stack, I think. And um, it has to, to, you know, it mixes with a bit of economics and, and game theory. Uh, but so proof of stake is a class of algorithms. So convergent proof of stake, which is well, what Mike has designed in the first place, uh, isn't the, the, the very first one ever, but it has been in the workings for like three or four years, I think, Mike, it was. Uh, but yeah, about uh, three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 
Could you tell us how is it exactly different from uh, usual proof of stakes algorithms? So, I mean, I, I, think you, I think Adam's exactly right. Proof of stake is a class of systems where consensus is agreed by a, a stake, so some kind of weight. And Convex does use stakes, and it's it effectively it's a, a type of proof of stake and uh, algorithm. I think the most important difference with Convex and potentially other other decentralized networks is convex consensus is actually implemented as a CRDT. So it's a conflict-free replicated data type. And these are these uh, data types that have this beautiful property that you can merge two instances together and get a new instance. And if you happen to do that in a repeated fashion, e.g. by gossiping the, the values around the network, then as long as the merge function has the right mathematical properties, and there's some lovely mathematical papers if anyone wants to dive into this, you can actually prove that it will eventually converge to a stable state. And that's what you want for consensus. You want this convergence to a stable, stable state, which then um, um, you know, forms the basis of your agreement around the ordering of all the transactions, which is then how you uh, compute the updates to the global state. Now, can't go into too much detail here on how that merge function works. We basically found a merge function that enables you to implement proof of stake as a CRDT. Yeah, so that um, it, the, the merge function takes into account the stakes of the different peers and the merging happens in a way that is consistent with the votes of the, of the peers in the network. So. Uh, it's all in the white paper if people want to dive into more depth, but hopefully that's given sort of a brief overview. The key idea is a conflict-free replicated data type, therefore it's guaranteed to converge um, under, the, under certain conditions. And two things that are apparent from this is that, so in, in blockchain, the word blockchain, you have the word blocks, of course, because what you end up with usually uh, at the end is a chain of blocks that are indeed cryptographically linked, right? But here it's a bit different. Um, so transactions are being grouped in so-called blocks. This is what uh, peers emit to other peers, groups, blocks of transactions. Um, but there is effectively no leader. So any peer can emit a block of transaction at any moment, right? Whereas in even other flavors of proof of stake, uh, you tend to have quite often a notion of a leader so that only one peer at one given time can uh, broadcast a block of transactions. So that's one of the reasons also why uh, Convex is so fast, even on, on the network level, we could say. And uh, having that kind of CRDT also means that those blocks are not cryptographically linked. Uh, they So peers vote on an ordering. So there is a sequence of blocks at some point, uh, but uh, it's a bit different from the usual blockchain in, in that aspect, right? Technically, we could say that it's already something a bit different from, from a typical blockchain. Okay, thank you. That was really useful uh, explanation. And um, mm. yes, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to having a look at the white paper that's on the website as well. That should dive into a lot more detail, I expect. Cool. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Renzo, have you got more questions for yeah, that side? Yeah, we can go for one more question for sure. And yeah, remember to raise your hand for live interaction. Um, this is for Christopher Baptiste um, from Jakub. I gather there is a some impedance mismatch between closure and dart due to the types, nil handling and such. It seems you have made great progress, but do you think you will get to a point when writing Flutter apps in closure script will be painless without running into the into the mismatch? Or will there remain some corner cases where the interop will remain painful? So I'm going to start. Um... I'm writing a, a closure dart application, iOS application uh, right now, and um, I found the experience uh, awesome. <laughs> uh, but there are still um, like uh, Jacob, Jacob, Jacob said, um, we are not still uh, at the level of uh, interaction. Uh, greatness like closure and closure script. Uh, to be honest, <clears throat> I really don't know if we can uh, achieve um, that, but um, uh, 
I don't, I don't think types will be necessarily uh, an interrupt will be necessarily uh, the, the main pain. Um, we, we really have to find out uh, uh, how we could have a better, a better repo and how to load experience. Uh, actually, actually, we don't have a repo right now, uh, but we try the design uh and uh, it's working but uh, yeah what, what's your opinion uh, christophe uh yeah to on the impedance mismatch between closure and uh, and that i've got we i think we have got it mostly under control now there there are some some things with, which are going to to be addressed by the but what we call the magic cast which which are wrappers which are automatically inserted by the compiler by the closure compiler to to make sure that we transform the the input into a wrapper of the of the suitable type for that but uh, yeah, just from the relationship between the two languages, uh, I think we we don't have much to much to fix yet. One thing that's worth mentioning is that we never designed closure that code to be callable from that code. The intent has never been to be able to create uh, libs to be used by regular dart code. Uh, that said, to add to, to what Baptiste just said, well, we don't have a repo yet, but we have uh, made a proof of concept very early in the development. And the focus currently is on the on the batch compiler, which which we can then couple with the auto reloading feature of uh, Dart to produce the same developer experience as the one that uh, that developer are used to, or even some uh, some people in the project community which uh, work with auto reload. Uh, that being said, um, writing a mobile application sucks. It's uh, it's hard. Uh, no, it's true. You you have to um, you really have to comply with uh, uh, iOS tools and um, uh, even if you you're using Flutter or React Native, you will still have to struggle uh, to compile your application. Let's say or to um, package assets. Uh, it's it's. It's not like uh, writing a web app or, or a pure Java closure application. Uh, you have uh, many rules. Okay, thank you. We have uh, probably another question from Johns. Uh, yeah, we've got a couple of questions. One's actually a follow up from the last question. Um, so just querying if there's any trade offs in the convex approach compared to traditional uh, POS networks. Is that something that's in the white paper or is there something you can say about that? I think it's probably a very, very long topic, um, <laughs> so hard, hard to answer. I think we have the best approach to POS in, in the sense that the CRDT seems to be a perfect fit for decentralized systems, and then we use we use POS. Now, there are obviously challenges with POS, yeah? I mean, it does require people to um, put stake on, on nodes and or stake on other people's nodes, and um, there isn't yet a long history of POS networks and how they behave from an economic perspective. So um, I think that's still a bit of an open question. Um, it's one of the reasons we're taking a lot of time to get this right and also to make sure that the economics are, uh, are viable and sustainable in the long term. But I'd say there's still a bit of an open question around what is the best way to make proof of stake work. Yeah, I don't think there's too many trade-offs. I think we've genuinely eliminated some bottlenecks and some some pain points in some traditional blockchain approaches. Um, I don't think we've given up too much, um, but you know, 
people can argue this all day because there's a lot of complexity and a lot of different uh, different aspects that are relevant. So, sure, uh, happy to debate further on the convex channel or something if someone really wants to get into the. Deeper. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, uh, on the on the uh, Discord channel, they're asking a couple of questions about that. And just one final question: uh, there's a query about um, adoption. I guess the question is really aiming at like, what does does COVID need, uh, Covex need anything to be successful? It's like to move move from this core cool product into actually being widely adopted in production or is it just a matter of people using it well yes uh, two things i'd like to say here is that um, that kind of open source uh, you know community um, project um, whatever we, we call it it can show some limits where we have to actually hit actual production so we have released uh, an alpha version it was in september i think so not that long ago we are slowly but surely um, go for, for beta but the problem is that if, when you want to actually launch a, a mainnet, as it's called, then you it's best um, usually to to have some kind of audit, for instance, from a third-party company who will uh, try to, to to break it and ensure that everything just works perfectly, that uh, you know security-wise things are just smooth. And um, unfortunately, that kind of of uh, steps require a lot of funding, right? And it's a bit hard. I'm going to be honest, it's a bit hard to found that kind of project because it's uh, a bit too abstract. So if you know Clodger and Lisp and all that, then and, and a bit of blockchain, then you, you can realize the value of, of a network like Convex. But if you have never heard about Lisp or any, anything like that, then it, it looks just very, very abstract, right? So uh, we, we, we have a bit of a Lisp curse going on here. That's the first thing I could say here. And the second one would be, about just having a strong community. So that's why we, we, we like talking to developers who aren't really into blockchain, because first of all, uh, that's the vast majority of developers today. Only a tiny fractions of developers uh, actually work in blockchain or decentralized tech, uh, because we like to expose that kind of ideas more and more and um, show that uh, it's interesting for other use cases than just NFTs and, and cryptocurrencies. Um, and so, yeah, we would like to see more people like that coming in and building a stronger community and, and have something going on uh, there, a bit more impressive. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, hopefully uh, people watching this uh, live and in the future will uh, be interested and take up that call to join our community as well. Thank you. Um, um, I, I wanted to just add for Christophe and Baptiste that I, I saw your um, Tensegretics Tensegritics closure dart repo. So um, you mentioned that is uh, something is might go might appear there in uh, Q1 of 2022. So I wanted just to close asking you where people can go to help you out or follow your work in general. Twitter, uh, just follow Christophe and uh, and me, and uh, you will have the last news uh, about the project. Okay, <laughs> or create. PRs on the empty repo. <laughs> <laughs> I'll right. simply start watch the, the empty repo. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, looking forward to the evolutions of that. And uh, yeah, I'd like to thank Christoph, Baptist, Adam, and Michael for being with us uh, today, uh, answering questions. Your effort in putting together the talk, uh, very appreciated, very interesting projects. Um, thank you very much.